Welcome to the OSHA Integrative Speaker Series. I'm your host for today's interview with Dr. Michael Ferguson. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferguson, for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. So Dr. Michael Ferguson is a lecturer in neurospirituality at Harvard Divinity School, and is also the neurospirituality research director at the Center for Brain Circuit Therapeutics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So we are honored to have you here, and you're going to enlighten us, I believe, a little on what neurospirituality actually is. So I have a few questions for you. So I was wondering if you could, first of all, just describe broadly, I know it's a big topic, what neurospirituality actually is and how that evolved as a discipline. You bet. So let's break it down. Neurospirituality, it's constituted the first part of the word neuro, which of course is a reference to the brain. And then spirituality is a topic that a lot of people may think is not compatible at all with science. Um, within the Oxford Handbook of Positive Psychology, there is offered there a definition of spirituality that resonates quite deeply with me. Um, and it defines spirituality as a search for the sacred. Mm. And I love that definition for a lot of reasons. One, that it really reflects that spirituality can be a process. That it can be a, a quest mm -hmm. that is even a lifetime quest, that it's not static, that it's dynamic. And I love as well that definition of spirituality as a search for the sacred in the sense that it's very open and flexible that it can be inclusive of theistic or non-theistic perspective, right. of perspectives wherein spirituality is something that is essential or something that is constructed as a human project, um, or it can be reflective of an understanding of spirituality as something that is fundamental or something that is emergent. Um, and I think that it's it's pretty hard to argue that humans don't experience phenomena that they identify as sacred. And we can bracket that without having to go into the metaphysical conversations about what is the ultimate nature of spirituality. I love those types of philosophical conversations. But for the purposes of a neurospirituality scientific enterprise, mm -hmm. it suffices to recognize that the phenomena of sacredness is something that are something that have motivated people essentially throughout the entire course of our species. Um, and so neurospirituality, putting these two concepts together then, is a study of the brain's engagement in the search for the sacred. Mm -hmm. The brain's engagement for the search for the sacred. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And for yourself, your own trajectory, your life trajectory, what has brought you to this? What inspired you to pursue research in this area? Sure. It actually does go back to early childhood. Um, I grew up very churched. And in a Sunday school lesson, I've got vivid episodic memories of a Sunday school teacher putting a glove on her hand as part of an object lesson and saying that the glove represented the body, that the hand represented the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then she took the glove off of the hand and she said, this is now what happens at death, that the body remains inert, but the spirit continues on living. And that, I mean, for a little, for a little kid, yeah. that object that was so vivid. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, also at the time, I didn't have the language to differentiate what we would call dualism from non-dualism. And, you know, I, I, since that time, have had a lot of intellectual development and reconsideration, and there's been um, nuancing and revisions and how I think about these concepts of spirit, body, spirituality, corporeality, um, but a through line that has been consistent is an intense interest and an intense curiosity in the things that are referred to as spiritual. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I think we share that, yeah. <laughs> and um, I wanna get a little bit more into the actual research that you're doing. So what are you, what are you actually pursuing at Brigham Women's Hospital as? the research director there for neurospirituality? Sure. So most recently, we were fortunate to have a paper that was published in the journal Biological Psychiatry. And this particular article was using a technique that we have developed in our center called lesion network mapping. And I'll explain in just a minute a little bit about what lesion network mapping is as a method. But we applied it to stable traits related to spirituality and religiosity. 
and were able to identify in two independent data sets, a brain circuit grounded in the periaqueductal gray, which was related to these stable traits of spirituality and religiosity. Now, rewinding just a little bit to fill in some details about the method and then fast forwarding again to talk about the results that we obtained with this method. And Lesion can you also define what the periaqueductal you bet, you bet. So yeah. the periaqueductal gray is an area in the brainstem that is involved in um, a diverse array of functions, including pain inhibition, um, including altruistic behavior, uh, including fear conditioning. And even though this, this circuit defined by the periaqueductal gray was not a circuit we would have guessed in advance to be an anchor point for spirituality and religiosity. Now, as we look at this circuit and we look at the functions that it's known to be associated with, it's illuminating to me to recognize that there are uh, a wide range of overlapping functions mm -hmm. between the core uh, canonical understandings of the periaqueductal gray and then functions that are quite central in religion and spirituality. Um, you know, if you go down that list again of pain inhibition and altruistic behavior and fear conditioning. Um, you know, one of the, I guess the saltiest, if not most widely known comments about religion was by Karl Marx that it's the opium of the people. Mm -hmm. And so if you take that literally of, you know, opium being something that inhibits pain or, you know, sedates, uh, there is there's actually a neurochemical alignment there mm -hmm. of circuits involved in pain inhibition also being involved in spirituality and religiosity. And then with, um, with altruistic behavior, certainly religion and spirituality have inspired um, some of the most dramatic self-sacrificing and self-gifting behaviors that we've ever seen. Uh, and then with fear conditioning, it, you know, it's also been widely commented both within Holy Writ as well as within um, scholastic academic literature about relationships of fear and religion or spiritual concepts. So taken as a whole, what we do know about the periaqueductal gray and its circuits outside of the context of religion and spirituality actually map quite cleanly into the suite of behaviors and functions that have been associated with religion and spirituality. And so in terms of your paper and the research you're conducting is specifically around this area. That's right. Um, we, we looked at a few different types of additional ways to validate the circuit. One, for example, being to look at um, seizure onset zones in individuals who experience epileptic seizures and who also have hyper religiosity. So, you know, these pronounced increases in religious motivation or behavior in association with their seizures. And seizure onset zones that are associated with hyper-religiosity mm -hmm. fall within our brain circuit, um, which is, it's a nice convergence of evidence from a different uh, arena of neurology. Um, epilepsy and seizure itself for, for thousands and thousands of years has been observed to have a, a relationship with ecstatic spiritual experience or with you know religious experience and so that was one of the things that motivated us to, to explore whether the circuit that we defined and then the circuits that have independently been observed to participate in hyper-religious um, behaviors following seizure correspond to one another. And in fact, they do. That's interesting. Um, yeah. And then so, the, okay. so go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say some of the work that we're doing right now is to extend questions that arose quite naturally from our study where, again, in this particular investigation, we were looking at circuits where both spiritual and religious behaviors can be commonly localized. And in follow-up studies, I'm starting to explore ways in which spirituality and religiosity may diverge in the brain. So looking mm -hmm. at neural substrates for subjective spirituality, things like mysticism or mystical experience, in contrast to brain substrates for tradition-oriented religiousness, so adherence to institutions or adherence to 
uh, like a fundamentalist or a dogmatic set of creeds. That sounds very interesting. I'd like to talk with you further about that. Um, so just for our viewers, what are you trying to achieve with your um, research? What, what would be an optimum, optimum outcome? Oh, an optimum outcome would be understanding the nature of consciousness and life and the universe and reality. <laughs> okay, the big questions being but answered. More, but more modestly, a desired outcome would be to identify specific neural substrates that are associated with religious practices and religious dispositions and spiritual practices and spiritual dispositions for the eventual goal of translating them into complementary and mm. integrative healthcare approaches. Um, there's been tremendous work, really groundbreaking work that's been done looking at things like mindfulness meditation. And you know, back in, I don't know, the 1970s or so, when you had psychologists and scientific researchers who were starting to look at meditative practices that came out of the, you know, the Far East. Um, it, it, at first it was considered to be eccentric um, and yet fast forward a few decades. And now the idea of integrating mindfulness with cognitive behavioral therapy or with other forms of clinical health is very, you know, mainstream. Yeah. It's something that, that it's not even, in some ways, you know, it's not even considered alternative. It's just considered, you know, a very um, uh, almost routine mm -hmm. way to, to integrate holistic practices into clinical care. And so optimistically, um, I would predict that with similar careful scientific examination of a wider range of spiritual practices, that we might eventually see a day when we could look at the brain circuits that are involved in, for example, forms of contemplative prayer or forms of you know, mystical experience, whether that's catalyzed by psychedelic substances or whether that's catalyzed by ritual behaviors. And then also look at the brain circuits that are associated with specific clinical symptoms. Uh -huh. and make an evidence-based match to say, oh, okay, if, if brain circuit A is really involved in the clinical symptom that's most salient for this particular patient, then maybe spiritual practice A, which also stimulates that same circuit, could be a good therapeutic match in tandem with the other treatment that they're receiving for their symptoms. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, um, I think you've already given us a sneak preview into what you'll be presenting on March 1st. So Dr. Ferguson is going to be our grand round speaker on Tuesday, March 1st. And uh, we invite our viewers to, to join him and learn more about his work. And he's going to be presenting on neurospirituality, science, circuit, and soul. So is there anything else that you'd like to add to... Um, to just fill out a little bit of what you're going to be presenting um, on March 1st? Um, so I will be discussing a vision that is much more ambitious than I'll ever be able to complete in my own career. And so I would say come ready to collaborate and to think together and to get excited about ways that we can integrate neuroscience, spirituality, and patient flourishing. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson has his own website and he has a TEDx talk where you can learn more about neurospirituality. And um, I believe you've done a course as well, an online course, which is available for people to watch. So you can find those details on our website, oshacenter.org. And you can also register for the March 1st uh, Grand Rounds where the Dr. Ferguson will be elaborating what you just heard today. So thank you so much, Dr. Ferguson. It's my pleasure. Thank you.